Ten years before this video, From Software released Armored Core Verdict Day to less than stellar reviews, and a franchise spanning 15 games at the time was put on ice as the company decided to focus on their more lucrative output and as the series overseer, one Tashifumi Nabishima, left the company allegedly because he was passed over for a relative newcomer for the job of president. In 2023, From Software had more than established itself as a developer capable of selling out their titles, and the fandom the studio had meant they could really start to take swings at anything, and they decided to take a crack at another armored core. Internally, there was a lot of desire to return to the license, and the game actually started development in early 2018. Hidetaka Miyazaki himself helped lead the development in the early phases of the game, and the prototype they had developed was then handed off to Sekiro and Bloodborne veteran Masaru Yamamura to bring home. When it comes to combat, Yamamura is probably the best director in the studio, so it's obvious that the game he delivered on would emphasize that pillar of the license in its design, but Yamamura is also really good at pacing out levels to direct the player's experience to congeal well with the ambiance or theme the environment in question is going for. I think Sekiro's Fountainhead Palace might be his magnum opus in this regard. And this is something Miyazaki himself had helped really inject into Armored Core back when he directed the 4th gen games, and a lot of the acorns he seeded back then are very much vindicated by Yamamura leaning even harder into them than Miyazaki did. This doesn't come without pitfalls, like Nabishima noted and would correct for in the 5th generation titles, but no creative direction ever does, and seeing the atmosphere and player direction take such a front seat this time around is really interesting, considering the franchise's history and its ever-evolving identity. In this video, we're going to be diving very deep into the makeup of this game and the different voices which have contributed to this license over the years. I will be building on top of many ideas I've discussed in the previous Armored Core retrospectives I made, so I hope you decide to check those out before watching any further. I'm Azure Aesthetics, grab yourself a cup of coffee, and let's dive in. In the early days, when Miyazaki was still involved in the day-to-day -day of designing this game, he and the team went back to the older titles and tried to pin down what they considered the fundamentals of Armored Core to be. And, according to Yamamura, it's assembly. This is a good observation, and I'll note that when Nabishima was asked a similar question way back when, he said that Armored Core, at its core, is a game where the player gets to pilot mecha they themselves make. In the days of the PlayStation 1, Naotoshi Jin, the then president of From Software, said that Armored Core was never a truly unique idea until the customization was integrated into the experience. We seem to have a unanimous agreement in the top decision makers that whatever else these games might embody, they must be about the player making their own mechs. This pins the conceptual scope of the license down somewhat, but not as much as you might think, because the games express different sentiments and attitudes and themes, and the way they leverage the idea of assembly to tell their stories is very varied. You can usually get a sense for what the developers were bringing to the table by looking at what they are using the customization to emphasize. For the first three generations, Nabishima has said that his job was building on top of what he had done before. The fourth generation games changed everything because Hidetaka Miyazaki's games were much faster and to facilitate that change, every element in those games needed to be recalibrated. The old rules for how to make good armored core levels don't apply when the player can travel ten times faster than they could before and fly ten times higher. Also, the fourth gen games have the controls mapped to the analog stick, so the player has access to precise positioning, which most AC games before the fourth gen didn't. A shift in focus, and everything in the game needs to change, and for Armored Core 5, Nabishima pulled the same trick. He felt that the speed and the flying in the 4th gen games undermined the terrain and level design, which I think is a fair assessment, so he decided to ground the player and make the environment more of a feature. The 5th gen games also emphasized the multiplayer, and the two modes of playing the game were using the same gameplay, so the best practices in online needed to be able to deliver a good experience in the offline as well. That game was a lot more tactical than what we'd seen before, and like how speed changed everything, 
tactics also changed everything. And now, with Fires of Rubicon, I'm going to stake that Yamamura pulled this trick again, but that his heightened emphasis can really be put down to combat. I've played every generation of Armored Core, I've missed out on some of the spin-offs, but still, I've played enough of these games that I feel confident saying Fires of Rubicon has easily the most satisfying minute-to-minute -minute combat in the entire franchise. Partly, I will grant that this is down to the unchallenged level of polish this game has compared to its predecessors, but the actual nuts and bolts of the attack patterns, the weaponry, the way customization is tuned, the way enemies behave, the way levels are laid out, etc. However, it might drop the ball here and there in some aspects, and when it comes to handling certain things, the franchise maybe did better before. When it comes to the fighting, this is the best Armored Core has ever been. And I don't think there's any major overhauls in the game which I can't rationalize by pointing out how it made the combat itself better. I noted already that Yamamura worked on Bloodborne and Sekiro, and I'm not name dropping these titles just to stretch the video runtime. You can actually get a bit into his head when you look at how those games play differently from what came before them and the rationalizations given to the changes that were made. When talking about Bloodborne's combat, Yamamura said that it was basically just a speeding up of the system they got from Dark Souls, which it got from Demon Souls. It's the exact same fundamentals, but the system there had the parries be accessed with timing the guns rather than timing the shields, and he described the dance of the battles as having an in and out rhythm. One reason I can figure for swapping the parry from shields to guns is that it gave combat more range, which helped mitigate how fighting was faster, and because it exposed the player. Miyazaki's direction for the experience of fighting in Bloodborne was that the player ought to feel like they were fighting for their lives, and you can sort of see how the tweaks Bloodborne made to Souls Combat helps that feeling come across. And that's not all. Bloodborne did not reuse Dark Souls' Esta system. Instead, it made healing dependent on combat. If you lose health there, you can regain it by attacking an enemy, and this combat system instinctively teaches players to be aggressive. There are lootable blood vials for healing if the player fails to find an opening to use the rally mechanic, the combat healing, but the rally mechanic is still very much the focus and it makes you more aggressive and it gets you into the head of a hunter which has to drumroll please fight for their lives. For Sekiro, the ambition was that the player thinks like a ninja and uses everything at their disposal as a weapon, and that the game should impart the feeling of clashing katanas. I wouldn't say I think the combat system there is as economic as the one in Bloodborne is, player direction wise, but from the death blow mechanic alone there's a lot of quality player direction. There's the easy stuff like how seeing those from a distance can lure us into an encounter, and that great moment where the serpent comes towards us in the palanquin and the death blow trigger is just a little bit delayed to tense the player out. And even in the more conventional combat segments, there's a lot to enjoy. The death blows vindicate the soft stealth mechanics in Sekiro where you're never ghosting your way through everything, but rather you take periodic dips in and out of cover to deal maximum damage. Stealth kills are insta-kills after all, so the combat system nudges you into incorporating those more powerful approaches more into your playstyle. And for the clashing of katanas, that's another big change from the old combat style which we can confidently put at the feet of Yamamura. Miyazaki tasked Yamamura with redesigning the combat when they were developing Sekiro, and the old in and out rhythm was replaced with a system where you are a lot more locked into an encounter, and if you back away from it, it's either because you took a lot of damage and need to heal, in which case you're giving the enemy back a lot of the posture damage they took, or it's because you triggered the enemy's next phase and they are doing some sort of AoE attack to clear their immediate environment in order to set up to your next encounter with them to be complete. There's plenty of quality player direction, even in the combat system in these games, so you can figure why they might have thought it was a good idea to put Yamamura in charge of their next Armored Core. One final ambition of Armored Core, which I've talked about a lot in my retrospective series so far, is that I think the tanky controls of the original games made a lot of sense for imparting the feeling of controlling the pilot rather than the mech. The controls were clunky because we were literally in a clunky old machine, 
The later generations were faster and flashier and this sentiment felt less and less emphasized, but the line blurring the pilot and the mech has also gotten more and more transient with each title until now, where the lingering humanity of the player is very much an open question. Our player character has been augmented so much that I'm not sure how well they'd do if they were removed from the mech. Fires of Rubicon is solidly in the group of we control the mech rather than the pilot, but since the two have now become more or less the same, I feel this sentiment still somewhat applies. The creative stuff happening behind the scenes is interesting, to me, because the more you peel back the layers, the more you can begin to try to connect the people and their sentiments on game design to the decisions made for this game. Out of all of the big changes which Armored Core 6 brings to the table, however, I feel none might be more pronounced than the story. The central pillars of traditional Armored Core stories are more or less all found here. We have warring corporations, a mech war, we have an AI with dubious motivations, but the actual story told with these entities and phenomena is very different from what we saw in the Nabishima days because Fires of Rubicon is informed by the Miyazaki style. We saw some of that in the 4th gen games he directed, but now it feels like the restraints are gone and they've gone all in on the ideas he likes to think about in his games. For example, prior to Miyazaki, Armored Core was not very interested in the esoteric borders which make up the world and how their disentanglement creates beauty and horrors. Stylistically and content-wise, this game feels a lot more like a continuation of Bloodborne than it does Verdict Day. What with the idea of human evolution, voices which reveal themselves to chosen fighters, institutes of learning which unleash horrors, stagnation and still waters, the transient nature of existence, and most importantly for this franchise, make-believe science. We've seen some obvious embellishments to reality in Armored Core before, but this game is dipping its toes into magic. They throw around phrases to try to ground the magical phenomenon here, but it's magic. Because the idea is not so much to critique humanity like in the older games, but to wonder what comes next. Armored Core 6's first major deviation from serious tradition is its choice of setting and era. The numbered Armored Cores usually reboot the license and start a new continuity which subsequent spin-offs will follow up on. Fires of Rubicon is not connected to the happenings in any previous game, but this is the biggest change I think a continuity reboot has ever ushered in. On the setting and era, most Armored Core games took place on Earth and the ones that didn't were still located in our solar system. One of the major themes of the franchise is the vulnerability of the planet mankind lives on and how the mech and corporate wars bring the ecosystem to its knees, which forces mankind to live in underground cities or some other retreat from the polluted wastelands they've left for themselves on the surface. Armored Core 6 is set probably tens of thousands of years in the future, and it takes place on Rubicon 3, a planet very far removed from Earth. The themes of ecological transformation and contamination are still going to be touched on, but the conflict on Rubicon 3 doesn't have the same dire emergency as we saw in previous titles, because this isn't the only planet mankind has. In this game, humanity is a very advanced interstellar civilization, and it's hard to imagine losing one planet would be that big of a setback, considering the massive engineering achievements these people are capable of. Previously, a planet being destroyed was a cataclysmic event which would set humanity back possibly thousands of years while the environment recovered. Here, the cataclysmic fires of Ibis event is still in living memory, and Rubicon 3 has already been reoccupied. The presentation of the story, however, is very in keeping with the license, and I'm of two minds about this. I feel like we maybe are really in need of email screens from a lot of different perspectives like in the older gens or a newspaper like in Verdict Day, to help flesh out the world a bit, because the groups and acronyms that were being thrown my way were a bit much at the start. The series has always had a very obtuse and depersonalized style when it came to dispensing out its lore and detailing its current happenings, much more so than even the Souls games, believe it or not, and Armored Core had always rewarded players who went the extra mile to find out what was going on. I appreciate that this was maintained, but I also feel like in the later Armored Core games there had been some strides to make the basic happenings easier to digest, and I wonder if the game might not have benefited from that. 
Like, Armored Core 1 had a realization moment where you kinda connect to being the bad guy who does missions for evil corporations being controlled by an insane AI, and that went a long ways towards justifying the heart to crack narrative. They were deliberately tricking the player. Fires of Rubicon, not so much. There's mysteries to be solved, and characters gradually reveal themselves to be maybe a bit deeper and more intimately familiar with the happenings of the game's history, Fires of Ibis, for example, but the hard reappropriation of the series' story presentation stables I don't feel like add all that much this time around, with the exception of All Mind. But more on that later. It's not actively hurting my experience or anything, but it feels less like they went with this style because they felt it congealed really well with the story they wanted to tell, and maybe more like they wanted to show us how much they loved the original games because there's a lot of callbacks to every older generation. On the story presentation front, you can see this in the in-between Talking At Us cutscenes, which are definitely brought back from the 4th gen games. I talked earlier about how the acorns Miyazaki planted in the 4th gen games have really taken root in this one, and how this game is much more informed by his style than the older Nabishima style, and this might not have been so much a deliberate callback to his games, as it might just be him having honed some natural instincts for Armored Core after directing two of those, which came through when he was overseeing Fires of Rubicon in its early days, and got embedded so deep into the core of the game that when Yamamura took over, he had to bring out the best of them rather than try and replace them with other elements and stylistic approaches, which he might have felt congealed better with telling this story. If you look at the From Software games post Demon Souls, there's an interesting development in the Dark Souls games and Bloodborne in how those games are being constantly rewritten mid-development, but games like Sekiro, Derasene, Elden Ring, and now Fires of Rubicon seem to come out much more fully formed. It might just be that the teams are getting better at removing the cut content and all associated code from the games so data miners can't find that stuff anymore, but it might also be because of the way they design these games now, where Miyazaki's involvement is heaviest on the early part of development and how when the title is handed off to the longer term director, the story has been written out and the elements they have to work with are also more locked in, which makes less room for mid-development redesigns. This does have the benefit of locking a particular vision more in, but I fear that this might come at the expense of the overall design coherence. Miyazaki's instincts are not 100% the same as Yamamura's or Tanimura's, so handing prototypes off to them and letting them finish them might be limiting the creative expression of the directors since the games never have one distinct voice. So far, I think Elden Ring is the only title which suffers on the game design, and I think the development approach might be somewhat to blame. Fires of Rubicon came out pretty great, but if they decide to expand on this game with spin-offs like they did for Armored Core in the olden days, I'd really like it if Yamamura got to take full creative control to really give those games a distinct voice. From Software has never been shy about digesting its own games, and they have a set of ideas that they really like to ruminate over again and again, and in the lore of Armored Core 6, there's a lot of familiar looking elements. The game takes place on Rubicon 3, which is a frontier planet. It would be completely insignificant if not for the presence of coral. This is a valuable commodity with utilities as both energy and as a data conduit, and the value of coral is what has attracted the corporations to Rubicon 3 in the first place. In early versions of the game, coral was referred to as melange, which is the magical future site substance from Dune whose ingestion was necessary to make space travel safe. Armored Core 6 scripts a lot of imagery from Dune, and a lot of the meditative ideas from there inform this game. Ideas like the relationship between men and their environments, and how both can shape each other. The resource curse, where Rubicon 3's immense wealth of coral causes it nothing but headaches, and brings on the exploitative forces of the faceless corporations and mercenaries. Ideas like what it means to be human, and the dangerous allure of power. Fifty years before the events of the game, corporate bodies infested Rubicon like leeches to try to harvest all they could of the coral, but a cataclysmic scorching undid all their work and set the coral mission back half a century. This was the Fires of Ibis incident, and 
The ignition of the coral burnt Rubicon 3 and its surrounding star system and left behind a dangerous contaminant. Originally, it was believed that the fires of Ibis had wiped out all of the coral, but not long before the events of the game, more of the substance was seen on the planet and the mega corporations have flocked to the planet once more in a race to capture as much of it as they can. Predictably, the coral extraction is doing tremendous damage to the planet and its inhabitants. To safeguard their interests and to undermine their competitors, the corporations have brought with them mercenaries. The pieces are now all lined up for a traditional Armored Core narrative, but interestingly, those pieces are not very native to the franchise. Armored Core was never hard sci-fi, but this is clearly the least hard sci-fi AC game of the bunch, and like I already touched on, the ideas which kickstart the very conventional Armored Core setup what with the corporate mech war, lust for power, etc., those ideas are all very Miyazaki. The muting of the physical boundaries of life, the idea of a rotting stagnancy which infests the world, the mirroring narratives, this is not how the older armored cores were framed. There are commonalities with this game and the previous ones, like how existence is in a sort of a stalled transition and desperately in need of someone to tip the whole thing over to bring about a new era. But where Fires of Rubicon is exploring esoteric ideas like evolution versus regression, Nabishima seemed more interested in looking at human beings up close. His stories often centered around the drive to obtain power, rather than that being a narrative running in the background and when he looked at the future of mankind, he framed the narrative around how the line between men and machines can be blurred. After all, if a human being can mindlessly perform the tasks set before them in these games, if paying someone money and mech parts is enough to get them to brutalize civilians, what makes men different from machines, which are all about mindlessly following the tasks set before them? The franchise has rarely gone the extra mile to really beef up the significance of the protagonist other than maybe their importance to the happenings. So the player Raven is usually very significant in the lore of the worlds because of the actions they performed, but the characterization is almost non-existent throughout the entire franchise. Armored Core had almost always had a very depersonalized attitude to storytelling, and while this game is a lot more character driven and there's a lot more interesting personalities clashing here than in the older games, we have what might be the most dehumanized protagonist yet. Because in Fires of Rubicon, we play as C4621. The only significance I could find for this naming was that it might be a play on Jean Valjean's prison number in Les Miserables. <laughs> Les Miserables 24601. If that's the case, maybe before coming to Rubicon and before becoming an AC pilot, we were a prisoner who was sentenced to be augmented or who volunteered for it in exchange for freedom in the future. The C4 part of our name marks us as a fourth generation augmented human being, and we are under the control of one handler, Walter. Fourth generation is interesting because we are by all means an outdated model, and augmented human being is interesting because the idea of cybernetically augmented humans has gradually become more and more the focus over the course of the series, with the first game having the concealed human plus subplot and the last armored core before this one, Verdict Day, having the design to be out in the open. And actually in that game, the cybernetic augmentation was dangled in front of our crippled friend Maggie to turn her against us because her deepest wish was to be able to fight once more. And now, in Fires of Rubicon, we are canonically cybernetically enhanced, so this idea has gradually made its way from being a tucked away little hidden storytelling failure state to being embraced wholeheartedly by the main campaign to Armored Core 6, which takes it completely for granted. In the story trailer for this game, we see a squadron of ACs being wiped out while a disembodied voice talks about how Walter is helping him clear his inventory. We also see ourselves underneath a tarp with many wires connected to us. The squadron that was destroyed comprised of 617, 619 and 620, and we learn later that Sola destroyed 618. Clearly Walter has been trying to get a good foothold into Rubicon 3 for some time. The mechs here are using the same parts as we begin the game with, and interestingly enough, it's all R.A.D. stuff. R.A.D. connects to Cinder Carla, whose story is connected with Walter's, and this is an early hint at their bond. 
Also, in this story trailer we see that Walter has a cane and the machinery which lifts off of us once our augmentations have been completed look eerily similar to what we saw in the Human Plus cutscene in Armored Core 1. Just in case there's any doubt what's going on. The reason we fight is because we've been promised an opportunity to one day be able to start a new life, which is a very ominous premise that makes me wonder what the day-to-day -day life in this universe must be like. From the title, Fires of Rubicon, and from various characters and phenomena and happenings in the game, we can see that the history of Rome was on someone's mind during development, and the relationship we have with Handler Walter is very in keeping with the paternal relationships in ancient Rome, where a father had complete ownership of his children. An ownership so fully realized that he could order them to do anything, he could sell them into slavery, and he could even have them executed on a whim. Handler Walter is not that cruel to us, but he is very much in control of our life. It's by his order that we illegally snuck onto the surface of Rubicon 3 in a scenario which resembles the menu cinematic from Armored Core 2, and one of our very first objectives after we land is to acquire from a dead mercenary a license to be here. The one we find belongs to a raven, and that's where we get the moniker from. It turns out he's not dead and we'll actually have an encounter with him later on. And let me tell you, it is very hype. After acquiring the license and really making Rubicon our theater of operation, we can dive headfirst into the insane mech war. When I finally got my hands on the controls, I was kind of surprised by how much it felt like the game was jettisoning much of the franchise's development and seemed to have just gone back to the formula established in the first one and carried on into the fourth gen games while trying to spiff up and modernize what we got there. The developments made in subsequent titles are here, most notably the analog stick control and the quick boosting from Armored Core 4, but since I'd been playing a lot of the 5th gen games before this one, it felt like they were just scrapping that and plowing ahead on recalibrating the DNA which had evolved into the 4th gen games. The 5th generation titles were messy in parts, but features like climbing and the scan mode definitely feel warranted to re-examine in the future. I'd hate to see the series drop them forever. What we have here is basically the most polished version of Armored Core 4 we could ask for, and a lot of the detractors from that game will hopefully find their complaints addressed. Much of the combat can still be overcome by simply bouncing around the terrain, but they've gone the extra mile to curb the excesses of the flying we saw in the 4th gen, so sometimes you'll want to take cover, and whoa! Nabijima's complaints about how the 4th gen's flying made the terrain mostly negligible seems like it's been addressed without sacrificing the quality scenario direction which the flying there was able to achieve. More on this later. Another complaint from the 4th gen games was that they more or less made the customization neglectable as well, and here I feel like they've solved for that by characterizing the different paths and styles very differently, and since so many different approaches are valid here, the customization feels more like a means to empower player expression than a desperate struggle where you need to use the correct parts because otherwise there's no way to make any progress. The older armored cores were never that difficult, but there were definitely moments, often in the arenas, where the game decided that you need to temporarily rebuild your entire mech to solve a problem. Sekiro got some criticism at launch for its brutal difficulty, even compared to its soul's predecessors, and I feel that critique is valid, but not the way it was made. Sekiro was not prohibitively difficult, I feel it just did a poor job ensuring that players clicked with how it wanted to be played. And when players finally reached a lock on progress which could not be overcome without a fundamental understanding of the core mechanics, they could often get lost for days. For many, this is why the Genichiro fight in Ashina Castle was so difficult. Guardian Ape was actually my stumbling block, and I must have been stuck in him for two solid days when I first played Sekiro, but now I think he's one of the easier fights, because I've actually learned how to be good-ish at Sekiro. At least I know what the game is expecting of me. And this is something I think Yamamura might have taken to heart, because Fires of Rubicon makes sure very early on that the player understands what this game is all about. So. The game starts with us landing and getting our license, then we make contact with characters like Rusty, and by the end of chapter 1 we'll also meet Air, 
And what I'm talking about with how the game ensures that we know how to play it early on is done in the end of chapter 1. The mission Attack the Watchpoint instructs for us to eliminate the SG squad in the Watchpoint and destroy the device in the control center at the heart of the complex. Handler Walter issues for us to be sneaky because the place is guarded by PCA operatives, so it's a bad look for the corporations to be seen there. I'll talk more about the acronym organizations later, don't worry, but for now, what matters is that after reaching the facility, we have to fight against Sola and then Baltius. Baltius specifically trended for a couple of days after the game released because players had a lot of trouble figuring that fight out. And I think he's kind of the Genichiro of Fires of Rubicon, in that Yamamura maybe wanted to really ingrain in the player what the game is not about. So every non-viable strategy going forward is not going to work against Baltius, and unless you humble yourself and accept the game's expectations and learn the combat in kind of a deep way, you will probably not make it past this fight. There was a lot of this boss is unfair discourse in the early days of this game's release, but like the case always is for FromSoft games, the moment players stopped complaining and actually learned the game, those conversations disappeared, and I haven't seen much of them since, since it's so apparent to anyone who's gone through the game already that not only is Baltius not unfair, but without him front-loaded the way he is, the player would have no shot at the rest of the game, which gets a lot of mileage by being able to take for granted that the player deeply understands the combat system. I kinda glossed over Sola just now, but I think he's an interesting character, which we should go over some more. So he's fought in the Attack the Watts Tower mission before Baltius, and even though the encounter is quickly over, we, and our character, learn a lot from it. It affirms that we are not the first pilot handler Walter has used to go after the Coral. Sola even says that he's killed some of Walter's dogs, plural, before. In the fight, we also learn that Sola is a first generation augmented mercenary, which is interesting because those only had a 10% chance of surviving the transition, and because early gen AC pilots heard the voices of the Coral. Sola actually used to work with Walter as C1249, but they split up at some point, assumably because Sola heard the Coral and didn't want to go along with the Overseer plan to burn it all, and now he lives seemingly to protect it. He's named after the Roman general who won the Civil War of 88 BC, and if we figure that FromSoft took more from the historical Sulla than the name when designing this character, it's interesting to note that he was originally an underling of Marius before Marius, who'd gone a little bit crazy, just a little, decided to take away his assignment in fighting King Mithridates and to go after him himself. Sulla then marched on Rome, took it over, then went and fought Mithridates, Marius came back, started executing Sulla supporters in Rome, then Sulla had to come back again, and it's a whole thing which basically ends with Sulla winning and being named dictator for life. This was the first time Roman politics had descended into one-man rule, and it lasted for one year, because Sulla resigned from the post after completing a lot of overhauls to Roman politics. Prior to Octavian, Roman politics was deeply broken and Sulla tried to fix it. That meant strengthening the Senate, limiting the power of the tribunes, and expanding the Senate to try to safeguard the Republic from any one man taking power the way he himself had. The planet in this game is named Rubicon 3, and I believe FromSoft named it that to mark it as a specific boundary of the world. Once you enter Rubicon 3, you never really leave because it changes you. This is an idea the game might have taken from Dune. In Dune, when you land on the desert planet of Arrakis, you ingest the spice, and if you ever stop taking the stuff, withdrawal will kill you. To leave Arrakis, you must take a part of it with you. In Fires of Rubicon, the lives of those who have history with Rubicon 3 seems to perpetually gravitate around this planet no matter how long they live or how far away from the place they get before inevitably returning. It isn't because of a chemical dependency though, it's more of a spiritual thing, so they come back to fulfill promises. And like in Dune, there's a sizable population which does not want to leave, but here it's because they want to make money mining the place or because they have a semi-spiritual awakening and begin to see themselves as belonging to this planet rather than any other. 
From Software's games often deal with the idea of the loosening boundaries of the world and how beauty and horrors can spring from a lack of defined order. And it was in crossing the Rubicon River where Julius Caesar was no longer just a criminal in the eyes of the Roman Senate who had extended his governorship and played Roman politics like a game. In the eyes of the Senate, crossing the line made him an enemy of Rome. So while the line, or river, might be completely arbitrary, it still separated two very different realities. And this is important because Sulla and Marius's war was the prelude to the first triumvirate and eventually the rule of Julius Caesar. So the history of Handler Walter and Sulla might be a backdrop to our adventure, like how the war of Marius and Sulla was for the war of Caesar and Pompey. If that's the case, he might be a proto-version of us, like how Sulla was kind of the proto-version of Caesar. They were on opposite sides of the civil war, and Caesar was almost killed in Sulla's prescriptions, but I mean in that they are both enormous figures in the story of Rome's transition from republic to empire. I'll talk more about how this connects to Sulla later when we discuss All Mind, but the basic idea is that Sulla took a few steps into the new world, but ultimately doesn't go all in, whereas we, Overboost, strayed into it. Armored Corsola and us are both exceptional and powerful AC pilots, but only one of us will change everything. Rubicon 3 has always been either in a state of exploitation or just in a state of waiting for further exploitation, so it's not like there's a big status quo which the Rubiconians can appeal to. But there is an idyllic vision of Rubicon 3 that they believe in, like how Sulla did for Rome, and because of the current power battle, the cohesion of every faction's version of business as usual is a bit up in the air. And while that's the case, we have the opportunity to decide what the future will be. Armored Core 6 does not have a keep things the way they are kind of ending. After defeating Sulla, we get into the Watchpoint facility, blow up the device which Walter directed us to blow up, and then we get caught up in a coral search and make first contact with air. And after we make our way out, we fight against Baltius. I already talked about the significance of this fight in priming the player for that gameplay experience to come, but there's also some storytelling significance here worth going over. First of all, Baltius's name, like Sulla's, has some interesting connections to ancient Rome. A Baltius was the belt which legionaries would wear to support their tunic, and I figure the orbiting rings around Baltius are his belts, and is why he's named this. Not as deep a cut as Sulla, maybe, but still cool. The more interesting storytelling to note about this fight is how it gets us to engage with Air and learn from gameplay that she's not a malicious entity, that we can actually trust her. When you consider everything going on in this battle, it might be that the fight against Baltius is the most important moment in the game, structure-wise. Because it not only acts as a threshold where the player must understand the mechanics on kind of a deep level to advance further, but it also serves to let us grow a bit out of the role Walter assigned to us since we now have another character to bounce off of. Air is a different kind of Armored Core character. This isn't the first time we've had disembodied voices talking to us, but it is the first non-human entity to do this which is not an AI. Armored Core was always very much about human beings, but because this is seemingly a spiritual sequel to Bloodborne, strangely enough, who could have predicted Bloodborne 2 was a mech game, uh, and the story deals with the transcendence of humanity, we have aliens now. And really, I can't say Air is a bad fit. Coral seems like a reimagining of the idea of Kojima particles from the 4th gen games. Those were a dangerous pollutant, and the conflict there turned out to not so much be about the ideals of the factions as much as it was that the Kojima contamination needed to be addressed before the planet was destroyed, and those games got a lot of mileage by showcasing the length to which humanity would go to ignore problems which undermined the beneficiaries of the prevailing order. Here, like Kojima Particles, the coral can be hazardous, but it's also alive. Visually, I think the distinction between Kojima Particles and Coral is interesting because the Kojima Particles were a saturated blue-tinted green and they created a filter which made everything look distorted and radioactive, kind of. But the Coral is a red, diaphanous, wispy mass which always seems to have a graceful breeze about it. The way coral being an energy source is explained is that coral has a very high temperature and it can actually grow and replenish itself. 
meaning a machine powered by it could practically run forever. But the immense heat is specifically the property which has made coral so dangerous because if it is ever ignited, the flames which arise are too wild to be contained and the scale of the burning leads to tremendous destruction. And that's what happened with the fires of Ibis. Rubicon 3 and the surrounding star system was blasted to hell and it's only now, half a century later, that mankind has returned to Rubicon 3 because once again, the coral has been seen. The mech arms race is over whose organization will control the coral, but with air, we learn that the coral is a living thing which does not want to be used as a mere energy source. This is the motivation given to air, and since we spend a lot of time with her, and since the game doesn't really try to justify the actions of the corporations, you'll probably come to see things her way. Coral can't always stand up for itself, so she needs us to help her. The intelligence living in the coral can reach out and communicate, but only with certain augmented human beings. We see in the game that the coral is capable of infiltrating machines and mechs, so you might wonder why they didn't bother just doing that and stand up for themselves, but I figure coral isn't so much a living thinking entity as much as it is the potential for it. Kind of like how the old blood in Bloodborne doesn't make people into great ones, it just makes the boundary of life blurred. So the coral creatures might exist only in the line between men and machines, which is why cybernetically augmented humans are the only ones who can talk to them. And maybe it's even the case that the coral needs to interact with augmented humans in order to awaken a sort of individuality among the rat mass. Without this, coral might not so much have a will as it just has instincts. It is usually found deep underground, and large-scale mining operations are needed to harvest the stuff, but when coral has breached the surface, it just floats around like it's immune to the effects of gravity, and if enough of the stuff is gathered together, it seems to seek out more and more coral to absorb into itself in a process known in-universe as coral convergence. Old Blood in Bloodborne removed the parameters of the physical form and allowed for the body to be reshaped. Since most people there lacked the insight to guide the process, they descended and devolved into mere beasts, but those that would become great ones did not. Coral was used in augmentation surgeries in the past, so there's even some in-universe ruminations here on how this material helps blur the line of a physical existence to allow the bridging of the gap from one way of life to another. And if coral can be used to change people, maybe certain people can be used to change coral. If the material is not inherently individualistic, it might be that it simply obtains the properties of the phenomena it interacts with, or that it exists as a sort of bridge between the physical and digital world and that it needs to make connections with human beings before it can conceptualize of itself as a creature with a will of its own. While the parameters of the story have shifted around and the esoteric musings of Miyazaki have taken precedence over the more practical human philosophies of Nabishima, the big picture components of Armored Core are still here. Corporations, mech war, economy, power, etc. And this is also the case for the gameplay. In describing it, Yamamura said, The general game cycle is to clear missions and you earn money and use money to buy more expensive weapons and parts for your mech. And also, within that, you are tuning these parts, and you're tuning the weapons, and tuning your mech to suit your playstyle, changing parameters, changing the performance of various parts to suit the way you want to approach each mission in each battle. Throughout my series retrospective on Armored Core, I've said that the games at their core are about doing missions for money which you use to get better parts, which you use to be better at the missions, which you need to be good at to get a big paycheck. The games have toyed around with the amorality of this cycle, but for Armored Core 6, I think it's fair to say we're once again veering much further into the sincere, which might be another showcase of Miyazaki's style overriding the Nabishima style. Certainly the 4th gen stories were less cynical than what had come before. Nabishima's games often had us blowing up strikers or some such in our gradual path to overcoming some tyranny, but the 4th gen games were much more upfront about things, even considering the whole Omer Thermidor scenario, and there wasn't a lot of fun had by the developers at the player's expense. Of the three components of the core gameplay loop, Yamamura and the extended development team have emphasized customization as the most important. I noted as much earlier. 
One big way Assembly has changed from previous titles is in how the internet has allowed for decals to be shared around and really blown the doors open on just how much you can make your Mac your own. I've seen a lot of really inspiring designs, but when I got my hands on the thing, I decided to just make my guy look like a goofy version of Metal Gear Rex and call it a day. I missed having the pencil to actually draw things myself, or if the pencil feature is there, I just never noticed it, but the ability to add layers to the illustrations was really cool. I don't 100% remember if we could do that before. Otherwise, this is a shockingly faithful recreation of the old system. One development I fully expected to see return from the 4th gen games was the ability to choose from a lineup of different mechs at the start, and I was surprised to not get this. Say what you want about the customization there, having a choice of some different builds at the start definitely helps get the player moving on the path they want to build their mechs, and I also think it could have helped players tune their strategies around some rather than having them learn as they go. If you'd have gotten a mech at the start which has the classifier slow moving but lots of health and damage, you know instinctively how to play that build and what to expect when you begin to change parts around. Instead, every player begins with the same basic mech, and the tutorials we have access to aren't tuned around any one specific build, but rather give us an overview of the different functions of the different parts. The starting mech is actually really close to my preferred playstyle of Zippy Sumi Laser Sword and Gatling Gun Guy, so I wasn't exactly disappointed by what I got, but I think it would have been better to have given players some options. It doesn't take long for the build paths to open up, so it's not like we're locked on a very tight path for an extended period of time or anything, and I will say that once we get access to the alternate parts, there's a lot to like about how different the optimal approach through a level becomes. The customization system is the same as it was way back in the first game, where we swap out our cores and lock different parts into different sockets while worrying about energy usage, weight, etc. The roles which the different parts play into characterizing the experience is very intuitive. Legs control movement, guns control combat. Things haven't been dumbed down any, I don't feel, and I think it's a wonderful thing to see people getting so lost in the spreadsheet management and hyper fixating on tuning things around to get as little as 3% an increase in efficiency. The developers haven't lost their touch on this front, and I think it's very comforting in a way to see an action game which plays like this and has this high an upfront demand of the player's attention to stack management. I think it's really nice to see that this sort of game can thrive as it closes down so many bad arguments often used to try to rationalize and favor the streamlining and homogenization of video games. I talked about how I like to be a zippy guy with a sword and a gatling gun in these games, and I was really happy to see that in addition to the energy efficiency, weight, and health, I could also choose to prioritize damage dealt with specific weapons with my mech parts. I can buy arms which have a higher proficiency at melee, and I could buy boosters which have higher damage outputs when doing boost melee attacks. There's a lot of different values players have at their disposal, and adding these sorts of specializations to the parts I think goes a long way to justify the inclusion of this many parts. Sure, my generator and hands might have been outclassed in every other department by a part I also had access to, but just adding this melee affinity made the lesser parts worth it to me. And that we have all of these added damage variables to juggle around here, I think kinda supports my argument that Armored Core 6 is distinguished by combat just like how Armored Core 5 was distinguished with tactics and Armored Core 4 was distinguished by its speed. Since we spend so much time building our mechs, we get a real sense of ownership over the thing, which makes it all the more impactful in the story when the mech itself or its proficiency at fighting is highlighted. I'll note though that this might have been cheated somewhat. Obviously, the narrative is not celebrating us because we made good choices. Those lines were recorded to play no matter what, but what I actually mean is that the strength of the customization here is basically in how it doubles down on the approach we saw in the 4th gen games and corrects for the issues on the back end. There, there was clearly optimal builds which you'd be a fool for foregoing. That made a lot of the builds and parts redundant. Players noticed this and many called for the build optimality to be scaled back to allow for other strategies to shine. And what I mean when I say that the problem was solved here on the back end is that the builds were not made weaker, but rather the missions and the enemies were designed in a way that more than one approach could be argued to be optimal. 
it's the rest of the experience which has been scaled up. After fighting Baltius and getting a firm grip of the game, I didn't find myself struggling much and while I initially thought that might be because I locked into a very good build, I'll admit that I had a Zimmerman ready to go at all times and this was pre-patch, I didn't really think it was my build that made the game so easy. I think the game just is easier in order to enable more ways of playing it. And since Armored Core's developers, seemingly to a man, agreed that assembly is the most fundamental element to the franchise, I'd say this approach was not only the correct one, but I really like the outcome, and I'm kind of surprised by how expressive the missions could get considering the amount of approaches they needed to facilitate. I'll talk more about the mission design in a bit, but before talking about that, I want to go over the factions a bit so we have a better handling of the various interests of the various groups. This franchise has a bit of a legacy as having a distinctly anti-corporate message, but it's actually shocking how often the corporate powers have turned out to be controlled by artificial intelligences all along or are being played by the AIs, which are just using the corporations as a front to try to manipulate mankind. And I mean shocking because this has happened at least four times. For the corporations we see in Fires of Rubicon, I'm off two minds. On one hand, they have absolutely walked back one of the greatest developments in the franchise, which really began in Armored Core 3, which was that the corporations had distinct ideological ambitions which helped characterize the world, and which sort of fast-tracked the player to reading the world from more than one perspective. But on the other hand, making the corporations in this game actually not be artificial intelligences, and making them for real only seem to care about money, does make way for different ideas of good entities to rise up against them. I haven't really been as uninterested in the corporations of an Armored Core game as in this one in a very long time, but the other organizations might have been made more interesting by making the corporations so nakedly amoral. The corporations are Balaam, which translates roughly to bullet, and Arquebus, which is a kind of gun and the forces which fight them are the Planetary Closure Administration, the Rubicon Liberation Front, the Overseers, and All Mind. The Planetary Closure Administration is a body whose job it is to manage the entry and exits from Rubicon 3. They have an armada of armed satellites orbiting the planet which destroy illegals going one way or the other and this is a funny development because it's very similar to the premise of the closed plan from Armored Core for Answer where Earth was also closed off with armed satellites. The ones in Fires of Rubicon, however, seem more intent on keeping people out than keeping them in, like the case was in For Answer. The Rubicon Liberation Front are the Fremen of this game. The Fremen come from Dune, and they are the native inhabitants of the desert planet of Arrakis, which Paul Atreides and his mother Jessica team up with after the Duke Harkonnen and Emperor Shaddam destroy their armies. One of the key ideas of Dune, which, intentionally inspired by Dune or not, has made its way into the Fires of Rubicon, is the idea that the environment shapes the people. Because Arrakis is such a harsh and cruel place to live in, the Fremen have become hard and strong people. And in the expanded series, we see that when the planet of Arrakis is turned from a desert into a watery place, the quality of the Fremen degrades because their rituals no longer have any relationship with reality and because leisure has become available to them. In Armored Core, after the fires of Ipids, there were survivors on Rubicon who were burnt, but did not die. They took the name Cinders and began to think of themselves as being distinct from the rest of mankind, began to think of themselves as truly Rubiconian. Another significance this idea of the land changing the people has on fires of Rubicon is seen in the people who embrace large transformations to their physical form and way of living just to become stronger. On Rubicon 3, strength is everything. But our strength ultimately isn't derived from the cybernetic augmentations we received. Though, those probably helped, seeing as it's how we're able to communicate with the coral. But mainly, I'd argue our strength comes from how we are a mercenary rather than a soldier. This allows us to shift in and out of allegiances and obtain access to gear and mech parts, which are out of reach for most pilots. The mech war necessitates that everyone scatters to obtain as much power as they can, and because we're technically not really licensed, and because our handler is very careful about not throwing away our life, 
we are immunized from a lot of the crazy war and instead our objectives are ones where failure can only come from our sloppy execution. We don't die because Handler Walter ignorantly decides to make a push for territory or anything like that. The politics of Rubicon 3 take many lives, but we are almost completely removed from that for the most of the game, so our strength in a way really comes down to how untethered we are from the big bulky and hard to maneuver bureaucracies. The Rubicon Liberation Front's mission is to safeguard the planet from the ecological disasters which will befall it if the corporations are allowed to continue operating. The Overseers are a small group which descends from the survivors of Institute City and who had a hand in the fires of Ibis 50 years ago. Their ranks include Handler Walter and Cinder Carla, and they fear the consequences which will befall the universe if Coral is allowed to escape Rubicon. So they plan on repeating history and burning the planet down once more. Allmind is an artificial intelligence which acts as the raven's nest of the game. It lets us access arena fights and seemingly handles the bureaucratic side of the mercenary war. Detailing casualties, operating the storefront, and such. The integration of the arena into the larger plot of the game is interesting. We unlock more brackets of fighters as we advance through the story and when we defeat an enemy for the first time, we are rewarded with some sort of ACOS chip. These let us upgrade some passive qualities of our mechs, which are independent of core parts. And like the case is with a lot of the phenomena in this game, once again, I'm off two minds about this. On one hand, it's weird to me that actual movesets like the kick and important build changing gear like shields are now locked behind completing a few arena fights. The armored cores always got a lot of replay value out of being relatively fast to finish games. Because they were so short, you really milked the customization in subsequent playthroughs to get your money's worth. The arena fights here aren't super long or anything, but it still seems strange to me that there are certain builds just not super viable without dabbling in a few of these fights. But on the other hand, these fights come together in the All Mind storyline, and the developers might have thought getting the player to complete these fights as they unlock was important enough that they opted to make the rewards more significant than just money, like in the old games. This kind of connects to how the mech economy in this game doesn't have its hooks very deeply into us and is instead a byproduct of the resource war rather than an active evil in its own right. The flavor of the mech economy in previous games often seemed to be that humanity had a pure core instinct towards mechs and destruction which was impossible to put down, but here that aspect of the license goes largely unutilized. And the perspective characters we have never try and make the reality of the situation look somehow glamorous or try to conceal it. The game does not try to trick us into perpetuating an evil system or anything like that. The factions I just talked about all have anti-corporate instincts and objectives and there's actually no path for us to submit to the whims of the corporations. It doesn't seem like that early on in the game though, because once the war on Rubicon begins to escalate, the corporations really seem to have the most momentum. After the Coral Surge and our fight with Baltius, Walter notices Coral gathering in the central ice fields. This indicates that there might be a big storage of the thing there, which gets the corporations moving, but the operation hits a snag when the PCA gets involved and activates an old Coral superweapon. Acting alone, the corporations cannot overcome the Ice Worm, so they team up and we join a large operation with the mission of taking the thing down. From our first interaction with Air and to the moment where we and Rusty are met with the Worm in the Attack the Old Spaceport mission, the idea of individuality has been slowly creeping into the forefront and at this point we've gone from unthinkingly following Handler Walter's orders to having interacted a lot with different characters and having our perspectives on the happenings around us be expanded upon. And for C4621, I think there's a definite turning point in the Defend the Old Spaceport mission. This franchise has often pulled the trick where the mission brief is not really representative of the mission we actually have to do, and this one primes us to defend the old spaceport, but once we rock up, we learn that all the forces stationed there have been destroyed, and when we get closer, the assailant's identity is confirmed and the hype fight begins. <laughs> 
the best of the mech bosses in this game is possibly this fight we have with Original Raven, whose call sign we stole. Original Raven is piloting the Nightfall mech, which sounds a bit like Nightball, who was an antagonistic AI piloted mech in the first gen games. The fight isn't too bad and it's a good showcase of the new combat style. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of boss battles which follow the twitch finger reaction slash execution challenge, I'll gladly point out that I think the bosses here have a lot of identity packed into them which is impressive because they're mostly using materials available to us. This isn't Demon Souls or Bloodborne where every boss looks and animates differently. The mechs here are all using our moveset or our potential moveset and the developers still manage to pack in a lot of characterization into the fights. Some of the tricks they used to do this was the music, the environmental design and presentation, the voiceovers from the different operators in the fights, the trash talking from the other combatants to their choice of weaponry, mech build and the approach to fighting they employ. Pound for pound, I don't think the game gets as much mileage out of its mechanics, at least when it comes to characterization and mission design, as say, Armored Core 3 did, but if we add everything up, this might be the most explosively expressive gameplay in the entire franchise. I talked earlier about how Yamamura changed the rhythm of the combat in these games when it came to Sekiro. Souls and Bloodborne was an in and out affair, but Sekiro and now Fires of Rubicon have a sort of tug of war thing going on where we enter the fight and stay in it until we either do enough damage to force the enemies to pull back or we take enough damage ourselves that we need to pull back and recover. The posture system from Sekiro was one of the most significant ways this system was propped up and it's returned mostly unchanged in this game. In Sekiro, provided you hit the blocks perfectly, you could theoretically stretch the defenses and the posture bar out indefinitely, but here the impact bar fills out with each piece of damage taken, and once it's full, we temporarily get stunned and get exposed to massive damage. And the dedicated tug-of-war encounters with enemies works because if you pull out of a fight like in Souls or Bloodborne, the enemy recovers their posture and the progress made in the battle so far is undone. Yamamura's idea when it comes to gamifying violence seems to be that the player should be able to attack enemies physically or attack their fortitude. In a mission where we take out the PCA's cataphract craft, we're mistaken for Nightfall Raven and it's revealed that he was responsible for leaking information to Archibus and Balaam about the conditions on Rubicon 3, which is why they came here to find Coral. I've talked about this already, but the game doesn't have any ending where we join the corporate forces, so whatever other choices we make on our journey through the game, the narrative characterizes original Raven as a bad actor. After we finish the fight, we learn that Raven is an inherited title and that it signifies freedom. This is not really the case in the franchise before this game, but the story here gets some mileage out of putting this out there because we do have a branching narrative and like I went over earlier, the story so far has seen us move from strictly following Walter's orders to exploring the world from a different perspective with air and gradually growing into being our own person. Raven was not an identity we chose for ourselves, but by defeating Nightfall Raven, we legitimize our claim to the name and affirm our individuality. So even though this boss is largely justifiable simply by the hype around it, there's also been a lot of ideas going on in the story so far which come together here. The Nightfall Raven fight is great, but I think Chapter 3 actually has a better fight in the Ice Worm. This isn't a mech, so the parameters for the enemy's expressive range isn't locked to the same stuff the player has access to. There's room for unique expressions here. The Ice Worm fight is one of the best missions in the game and, I'd argue, in the entire Armored Core franchise. A lot of it comes down to the setup. Before being able to really fight the worm, we need to use our connections with characters like Cinder Carla to get the weaponry we need to pierce the thing's shields. The game folds many of the characters we've met on our journey so far into the Ice Worm fight, and I feel like it really makes the epic moment the story is framing the fight as being actually feel epic. We saw some attempts at this in From's more recent fantasy games, but 
because those all had interconnected worlds and because they were strictly speaking set in a sort of apocalyptic setting, the grandeur or the epic scope we were supposed to connect or get out of the adventure didn't always land. You could just walk from the battlefields to the cities and take in the small scale, and the quests there, they often just advanced by variables flipping after we'd talked to some NPCs. The more interface-heavy interactions we have here abstract a lot of the behind-the-scenes politicking and you can sort of fill in the blanks. And because there are characters here which seemingly exist only to rationalize the actions taking place where we aren't, it's much easier to gloss over how the story is coming together in front of us. In Bloodborne, the story advanced because doors opened up. In Fires of Rubicon, the plot advances because the separate corporate interests are all rushing and scheming to get the precious coral, and we aren't in charge of the adventure so much as we're just sort of drifting in and out of things. There's trade-offs to each approach, but when it comes to delivering on the story of a mercenary slave who's up against massive organizational powers and whose exploits gradually gets them to take control of their own lives, the approach taken here is the superior one, maybe in every way. Sometimes there are story-changing phenomena occurring in the dialogue we see in between missions, and we have no hand in that, and sometimes the entire collective powers of the planet are all resting on us. Like in the Ice Worm fight. The direction in the actual fight against the Ice Worm is top-notch stuff. We wait for it to breach the surface, then have to hit it, and then the music stops as Rusty lines up a shot to take it out. All the while, our platoon is gradually being depleted until we're the last pilot standing and have to take the thing out ourselves. The Ice Worm's programming has it instinctively protect the coral, and since it has two layers of shielding, it wasn't possible to hurt it normally with let to the whole pre-worm fight tangents to get the weaponry necessary to make the fight possible. The boss is another example of FromSoft pulling from Dune, but the relationship between the magic substances and the worm is different. In Dune, the worms create the spice, here the worms exist to protect the spice. I mean coral. On the mission design, I'll note that the beginning of the Ice Worm fight is pretty similar to Radon's fight from Elden Ring, where we march towards the enemy with an army, but unlike I feel the case was in Elden Ring, the minute-to-minute -minute game direction and mission quality across the entire experience here is very much top-notch stuff with few, if any, major dips. This is not an open-world game like Elden Ring, so there is just fewer restrictions on the direction which the developers can impose on the player, but I think the tight implementation of the game's mechanics and the short missions might also have played a role. Elden Ring was a big mixing pot of different things from From's recent-ish fantasy lineup and I feel the mechanics there did not always make a lot of sense for the kind of game Elden Ring was. But the more linear structure of Fires of Rubicon and the tighter mission scripting means no mechanic here goes woefully underutilized or feels like it's ever out of place. Since the missions are so short, the developers had a tighter set of variables to tinker with when designing them than they otherwise would have, and the encounters here feel like they were carefully planned to bring out the best of the environment, which was itself carefully laid out to bring a certain kind of behavior out of the player. And there are some new mechanics to this franchise which I feel might just be here to let the player direction and the interesting encounters and scenario direction all work. Stuff like repairs. Uh, aside from maybe the garage in Armored Core 5, we didn't really have healing in previous games, but the missions there tended to be even shorter than the ones here, so restarting them wasn't as time-consuming. Also, with the healing, since it's a non-removable component, every player is guaranteed to have it, which means the levels do not need to obviously signpost every instance of danger and can take for granted that the player will be able to survive some hits. Sekiro's resurrection mechanic is very core to that game's identity, but it was not originally a part of the game. Rather, it was born out of playtesting, when players were dying too often and the team wanted to extend the duration of a given run. And I wonder if the repair system here might have come about because of a similar reason. Enemies hit very hard and they hit us with bullets and lasers, which are much much faster and harder to dodge than sword slices, which we can see coming from an enemy not too far away. Expecting the player to dodge the attacks here perfectly isn't very reasonable, though it is apparently possible to do a zero hit run 
So to allow for ambushes from strange directions and instantaneous scenario swapping where the player goes into one challenge but then is made to face another one, to allow for this, we have the repair system. To help with making the length of the levels more acceptable, we have the checkpoints in the missions. Those have technically been around in some previous games, but for the most part missions used to be one and done affairs, where failure set you back to the start. The Armored Cores were never difficult games, and the experience was very much meant to bring out the customization and sense of ownership of the mech, and if the games had been difficult all throughout, it would have been hard to deliver on the intended fantasy, since the player would have spent a lot more time configuring the mech based on viability rather than assembling something they personally liked to play. So, since the checkpoints legitimize a lot of approaches, helping to deliver on the customization fantasy, I feel they're actually a good inclusion, and like the repair system, they allow for the developer to take long durations in missions for granted and tune things around that. The shorter missions in the older games were often just about taking out X many enemies, and since they were, there's a sort of unspoken rule there that if the player's build did not have enough ammunition to clear the objective, their build was just not viable. This was solved for by just having a sword in one hand, so you technically always had an infinite capacity to deal damage, but here, the checkpoints also regenerate our health and ammo when we respawn, so you can be pulled much much deeper into a level. I had a sword on me at nearly all times, so I didn't really find myself out of resources and incapable of dealing damage, but if that were to happen, I figure it would probably have stung much more in this game than before, since the missions are so much longer, but the respawn screen actually gives us access to the assembly and lets us swap things around mid-mission, so things kinda work out. On the ability to access the assembly even when we're mid-mission, I do wonder if the developers had thought to bring in the resupply garage mechanic from the fifth game at any point. It let us not only restock on supplies like we can in Fires of Rubicon, but we were able to swap our build around. Those cost money to call in, but I feel like the economy in Fires of Rubicon is so insignificant to the experience anyways that adding a tax on something like this would probably go missed by most players. In older AC games, there was often an understanding that the player was the bad guy, at least for a significant portion of the game. Those games had us do horrible things in the missions just to get money, and the developers got a lot of play out of the simplistic economy they had set up. In Armored Core 1, Going deep enough into debt would have the game play an ominous cutscene where off-screen voices talked about experimentation and then we'd restart the game with our mech and some sort of easy mode activated. Like having the performance of our boosters be improved, or the overweight limiter removed because we had become a cyborg, which wasn't limited in their mech piloting abilities quite like humans are. This was Human Plus. It was the game's easy mode, which automatically activated if the player got too deep into debt, and the idea is that the powers above us sold us into medical experiments to pay off our debts. That game even has our name removed from the pilot leaderboards because our humanity was gone. And this was never actually emphasized in that game. There's some rumblings here and there about a mysterious Human Plus program, but unless you fell really deep into the death cycle, you didn't necessarily ever notice this. If we compare this to the economy here in Fires of Rubicon, I think it's fair to say that Armored Core 6 feels kinda half-baked. The economy is here, we get paid for completing missions and we use those funds to buy new parts, but after I cracked about 1 million Rubicon dollars fairly early on, I didn't ever think about the economy again. The currency is actually Coem, which reminds me of the Chom organization from Dune, but it's actually been the currency name ever since Armored Core 1, and it stands for Company Assured Money. At least it did in that game, not sure if they've made any changes to it here. Not every inclusion in a game needs to have some mind-bending awesome configuration or needs to be integrated deeply into a dark and mysterious subplot, but I think it is a bit disappointing to see the economy of all things be so underemphasized, because this is something the franchise used to be amazing at, and it's slowly becoming less and less noteworthy as the series has progressed.
The best utilization of money for storytelling in this game is probably when we start doing missions for air and she apologetically tells us she doesn't have funds to reward us with. We get to do things for her without the monetary reward dangling over our heads and me, what with my tremendous empathy, felt this was a neat way of characterizing our bond. Aside from this, I think there's not a lot to talk about. Because these games are all about corporate wars, you'd think the economy we interact with would be something the developers would like to twist around on us to emphasize certain ideas, but instead the story of the mech war is mostly told in the missions and with the cutscenes. After destroying the Ice Worm, we learn from Air that she's actually a Rubiconian who was born of the Coral. Also the Planetary Closure Administration which activated the Worm is out of the fight. They've been set back too much and leave Rubicon entirely. Arquebus captures their technology and the war between them, the RLF, and Balaam resumes. While this is happening, we begin to really uncover that Walter is not on Rubicon for money because he keeps sending us on weird missions which he attributes to a friend which, as we learn from Air, is not actually there. He's sending us deep underground to try and discover the ruins of Institute City. If Miyazaki likes anything, he likes a mission that's all about the player needing to utilize underdeveloped movement mechanics to complete a falling down level, but because the movement here is so fine-tuned and because we have so much weaponry, they must have felt the need to put enemy fire at the bottom of the well to make the scenario play better. And the reason the path to Institute City has us go down is because of things which rest in deep places. I'm happy to see how the Keigare meme has been able to spread in the community and I like to think I had a hand in that, but basically if you think of a river which runs through a land, we see that it starts as rain from the heavens, then after becoming a river, it is the source of all life and it moves impurities from the environment. But when the river reaches a still body of water where it stops, the impurities removed have nowhere else to go and begin to sink and in the deep they rot and become a seat bed for impurities. This is the idea with Aldrich in Dark Souls 3, this is the idea with the seat bed of chaos in Dark Souls 1, it's the idea with Maiden Astraea in Demon Souls, it's the idea of the Chalice Dungeons in Bloodborne, it's seen in Sekiro with the waters from Fountainhead Palace eventually running to Mipu Village, and it's in Elden Ring where Melania rests at the foot of the rot-infested Halleck Tree near a pool of still water. The corruption isn't stationary or merely physical, and it's not just a question of water. Water is just a nice way of thinking about it. The corruption, the impurity, is spiritual as well, and if you come into contact with it, you can become unclean and you'll corrupt yourself and your environment unless you are properly cleansed. From Software's games often showcase someone descending to the deep and bringing the corruption back with them, or just showcases the corruption and or its source in a very deep place. Here, that's Institute City. In my video on Armored Core for Answer, I talked about how I felt that the pacing of the missions was very hectic and that I felt that the ambience was underserved. I even brought up the Ratchet Nexus game and everything. Basically, when the missions in that game started, they started and everything got cranked to 10 basically from the get-go. The missions there were shorter than the ones here, so extended tension cycles or elaborate and slow pacing wasn't as easily achievable, but the momentary glimpses we got of ambient quiet time were so good that I really felt that game suffered for not going for more of that, just periodically letting us fly through a vast empty world. And I am happy to see that Armored Core 6 lands basically perfectly here with a lot of good breathing room and really atmospheric moments. You'd think it'd be hard to create dungeon crawly environments for Armored Core, but because the mechs are so deeply ingrained in the societal makeup of these worlds, it just makes sense that every pathway and interior is designed with them in mind. So we can go on extended tunnel excavations and sneak through air vents even though we're piloting a machine the size of a house. The flying is used for a lot of the ambient exploration slash quiet time moments and Nabishima's observation on the flight from the 4th gen games that it undermined the terrain has been largely solved for here. First of all, the flight duration is not nearly as long as in the 4th gen games. 
players have to periodically land their mechs to regenerate energy and since there's a lot of bottomless pits about the maps, they actually have to seriously take the environment into account from one flight section to another. It's not very punishing to fall down since, like in Sekiro, we just respawn near where we fell down with some of our health taken away. In Sekiro I think this made a lot of sense because the grappling about was often such a guessing game that penalizing the player would have been much more of a detriment than softballing the punishment for failure. And here, I also think this choice makes sense for a better of two evils reason. The flying is limited enough that these sections can be challenging, but it's also too limited to reasonably ask every build to pull these jumps off in their first try every time, and dying from a lack of energy would almost certainly have been too much of a drag on the missions. Another way the team balanced out the flying was how it exposes us to more enemy fire. This is pretty self-explanatory, but I think having this variable to dial around must have been handy for scenario direction. Obviously, boss fights should look cool, so the skies should be opened up, enemy fire reduced, but when the player is supposed to be moving slowly and methodically to have their traversal congeal with the mood of the story or the emotion of the characters they're talking to or whatever, it makes sense to make the skies more hostile, to ground the player. And just because the game has liberating flying mechanics, it's not like the developers had a rule that they must be emphasized in every level. I've talked about it often on this channel before, but a good challenge in a video game is often just a question of taking away from the player some input or mechanic they've relied on and asking them to readapt to the core challenges with a more limited moveset or a more strict interactive framework. For flying in Armored Core, this is often seen with progression requiring that the player threats through tunnels or doorways. And on that, I've noted this a few times in this series retrospective already, but the original pitch, way back when, for the game which evolved into Armored Core 1, was that we'd be piloting little robots in caves. No mission group in this game embodies that idea as much as our descent to find Institute City, and right before we finally reach our destination, we face off against Rusty. Rusty has been our buddy in missions, and he's gotten a lot of love from the community because of his friendly nature. He's a member of the Vespers, which is an elite squad of AC pilots working for Archibus. Their emblem shows From really squeezing their in-game phenomenon for storytelling, with a lot of the characterization of the members and the group as a whole being shown here. So, Rusty's emblem is a wolf with a muzzle, and it really makes him stand out since no other Vesper's emblem doesn't emphasize a human entity or body part. Then, later, when his ruse has been revealed and he's piloting the Steel Haze Ortis, we see that his emblem has changed to a wolf bearing its teeth. I'm not gonna talk about every Vesper's emblem here, but there are a few more I quite like. Swinburne's showcases a lobotomy in action, and it's kind of fitting since his Mac is the guidance and his character is all about not questioning the authority above him. I can't show you the footage of him defeating me because I'm too good at the game, in spite of everything, but when he does defeat us, he even talks about sending us off to a re-education center. And actually, if we let him surrender when he begs for us not to kill him, we later learn that he was sent to a re-education camp himself for dishonoring the Vespers. So yeah, lobotomy. Snail's emblem is faces split up into vertical segments. He's officially the second highest ranked of the Vespers under Freud, but because Freud is a bit unstable, Snail is sort of the unofficial head guy. Freud's emblem is an open hand reaching up holding a key which is fitting since he pilots the locksmith. He's the highest ranked in All Minds Arena, which is doubly impressive when we consider that he has not undergone any cybernetic augmentations. His bio talks about how he freely uses parts from both Archibus and Balaam, and that he loves to make incremental improvements, so maybe the key to being on top is that he isn't dedicated to one build or one solution for every problem before him. That would line up with director Yamamura's ambition that players would toy around and figure out ways of winning when things got tough. The group name, Vespers, might be drawing from the Asiatic Vespers, a genocide of Romans by King Mithridates, the same one Solai talked about earlier beating that war. He had a gigabrain idea to kill all of the Roman citizens who had settled in Anatolia, 
which weirdly enough, was the name of our home colony in Armored Core 4. He basically wanted to rid Asia Minor of Rome's influence, and if we translate the Vespers we meet to this, it might be that Archibus uses their elite squad to rid Rubicon III of the influence of the RLF, Balaam, and the PCA. Our fight with Rusty concludes with him retreating after his mech gets damaged, and us descending deeper to find Institute City at the base of the vascular plant. This is the heart of evil, of the happenings which befell Rubicon 3, and fittingly, the cave which leads out to the rusty fight arena, and by extension Institute City, is full of mealworms. Vermin and filthy animals tend to exist near Kegare. Institute City. First things first, I love the bone wheel skeletons. I mean, I hate fighting these things, but I love that they brought them into the game. But for the rest of Institute City, the fighting I think is really good. There's a lot of tight alleys, and here there's also collapsed towers and bridges to create cover above and beneath us, and the whole thing is designed with a lot of verticality, which does not actually undermine the combat. Being above is not always the best option, and I feel like I kept pushing forwards by taking a few steps back first and altering the angle of my entrance. I mean, you can absolutely just overboost through the entire level, that's fine, but playing it slow is pretty fun. I guess I'm a bit burnt out after Elden Ring, but seeing the tight level design and scenario direction from this company again is really refreshing. In the burnt out remains of Institute City, there's a lot of locks strewn around which tell the story of the fires of Ibis. Something we often see in a Miyazaki script is the currently ongoing narrative echoing events from the past. So, in Demon Souls, we had a previous war against demons and the old ones which ended after mass death with a singular figure, Old King Doran, being remembered as a hero, which is more or less our story in that game. The Dark Souls franchise has the evil age of fire being continually reimposed on the world, and the narratives of the failed to become Lords of Darkness are repeated in the backstory of Dark Souls 3. Bloodborne had the debate over brute forcing transformation versus reaching enlightenment first, be shown in the game's prehistory with Lauren and Ease, and then it ran into the more recent history of Bergenworth and the Healing Church, which split up into the choir and menses, and this idea even got some highlighting in the vermin versus phantasm debate in enemies like the snakeheads versus the mind flayers, and items like the Eye of the Blood Drunk Hunter and the Black Sky Eye. Also, we can see in that game's chalice dungeons that the ideas of beast hunting and trick weapons were clearly something that separate cultures had stumbled upon independently. On the echoing narratives discussion, Sakiro had Wolf and Kuro's story be mirroring the story of Tomoe and Takiru in the game's recent-ish history, and now in Armored Core 6, we see that the potential for the Fires of Raven are a direct sequel to the Fires of Ibis, and that the race for the Coral and the conflicting ideological sides has happened before. The Research Institute's scientists are a bit like Bergenworth in Bloodborne, what with being strange research guys who found a mysterious red substance underground, which has some transient border-defining property to it, and in their heyday, 50 years before the events of this game, just like Bergenworth in Bloodborne, they went a bit too far. Long ago, the Rubicon Research Institute built up the planet. The grid, the enormous pathways and towers which rise out of the ground and cover so much of the surface, was built by them. Armored Core often meditates on the idea of the people in the timeline of the game's happening living in the shadow of a much more technologically advanced society which came before them and died out. The Research Institute's last director was a man named Nagai, and he's kind of like Willem in Bloodborne. They both venture deep into experimentations with dangerous world-changing materials, and they both have their underlings. Nagai has assistant 1 and 2, but whereas Willem never lost faith in the old blood, he just believed in gaining enlightenment before using it, Nagai did lose faith in Coral. He saw the research destroy Assistant 1 and knew that the mutations of the Coral could be humanity's end because once it collapsed, there'd be no way of controlling it anymore. One day, he saw the Coral Tide rising and decided to activate the Ibis series. He knew his time was at an end, and he hoped that Assistant 2 would carry on his legacy while he ignited the fires of Ibis, which destroyed the star system. 
In ancient Rome, the ibis bird symbolized prudence and foresight, so it's fitting that the machines designed to keep the coral from going overboard are named after this bird. This story is weirdly in keeping with another story we heard earlier from Walter. There once was a scientist. He abandoned his family to delve into the secrets of coral. His work yielded a carnival of horrors, augmentation surgery included. But there was another scientist. He took his colleague's sins upon himself and set it all ablaze, died with no regrets. There's a lesson in this story. Once something's alive, it doesn't die easy. Walter's story is the story of Assistant One and Nagai, but what Walter doesn't mention is that Assistant One had a son, whom Nagai had Assistant Two befriend, and then he sent the boy to live with his friends on Jupiter before igniting the coral. And I think it's pretty clear that Walter is this boy, and that Carla is Assistant Number Two. Once we consider that they were here during the final days of the research institute and they personally saw the horrors which Coral let mankind release, Nagai talked about Walter's father experimenting with augmentation surgery, their storyline and the outcome they fight for becomes a lot more sympathetic and understandable. They aren't blindly afraid of the Coral, they've seen what it can do. After fighting our way through the city, we reach the base of the vascular plant and face off against another coral weapon, the IBIS series IB-01 Cell 240. The introduction to this boss gave me unnecessarily deep millennia flashbacks, what with the slow motion flight, the ground being lightly covered in stagnant water, the outspreading of the wings, the arena being in a very sunken location at the base of a gigantic tower, a uh, tree in Elden Ring. But the fight itself is not so bad. There really isn't another ice worm type fight in the game, so the rest of the bosses will be more in the vein of Boltius, what with twitchy reaction timings and carefully reading animations to try to get in some damage. I don't really hate these bosses, and I think the combat here is clearly the deepest and most engaging as a self-contained activity this series has ever seen, but I also think that the Strider and the Worm showcase the best practices for how to do bosses in Armored Core, because they pull a lot more from the Arms Forts Colossi bosses from 4 Answer, which I think are so much more interesting than the Zippy Sumi fights against the Max. One thing the smaller bosses do get at though, is emphasizing the revamped combat system. From the posture system in Sekiro to the staggering system here, we see what I talked about earlier where Yamamura seems to conceptualize combat as being a choice between attacking the enemy physically and attacking their fortitude. My sword plus Gatling gun and missile barrage combo was all about staggering the enemy as fast as I could and then swooping in with the sword for some heavy damage after their defenses are down. I suppose it would be possible to make a Colossus fight which allowed this to really shine, but seeing it with the mech fights is good enough. It's always interesting to think about how the combat system we use against mob enemies needs to be expressive enough to make a longer fight against the boss also engaging. Against the bosses, the combat system is less of a tactical take the enemies out with precision and power deal and more of an extended tug of war where we're constantly trying to break the boss's posture or their shield, and are trying to one-up them when it comes to positioning. With mobs, it's usually enough to give them some mobility, and then the challenge comes from being able to plop them down in interesting to navigate and overcome ways, but since the bosses here are fought in such open arenas, and since they have so much health, they need to act as not just a thing to avoid, but also need to create the environmental hazards and such. And although the principles for good combat don't change from fighting mobs to fighting bosses, having to integrate those practices into a singular enemy is interesting to see. I am a bit disappointed by how they solved for the environment with the easiest option of remove most clutter, since I think there's really something to be said about interesting boss arenas, but since the combat here is as ridiculously fast as it is already, I'm sure this wasn't done out of laziness, but because playtesting showed clutter boss arenas to be bad. Honestly, when there is clutter in the game, I keep killing myself with it by getting snagged like an idiot, so I really shouldn't be complaining. 
When we win a fight, the game slows down to give us a sort of badass moment, like in Sekiro, which is pretty cool. After defeating the Ibis series boss, we are shot at by the Vespers and taken out of commission. I'm usually not a big fan of moments like this in games where I know for a fact that if this had been gameplay I'd have been able to avoid the shot. The developers want to tell a specific story, and the section to follow is one of the highlights of the game, but it still leaves a bit of a bad taste in the mouth to see the story take the controls away from me in order to impose its vision rather than tell it with the mechanics on hand. We're already locked in a boss arena, so if the point is to have us be overwhelmed, why not just flood the place with Vespers after the Ibis series has been defeated and have them defeat us and disable our mechs? It ruins the idea of non-hit runs, but those aren't really as sacred to me as the characterization of my guy, which has been built up for many hours prior to this moment. FromSoft is usually pretty good at this sort of stuff. It's not often that I complain about the treatment of the player character by the game, and while this isn't exactly a game-ruining moment or anything like that, it does feel kinda cheap especially after we just took down what is canonically one of the strongest entities on the planet. After being put down, Walter is revealed to have had a contingency to help us escape in case we were put down. He puts us in a much older and less powerful mech, which made me think of the mech we saw in the menu cinematic way back in Armored Core 1. The game gets to play on our sense of ownership of our AC by taking it away from us and dumping us into this trash can, and I like how the obstacle course we broke through earlier is now recontextualized as a sort of stealth challenge because we have become so much weaker than before. I repeat myself, but a very easy way to create a good challenge in a video game is simply to kick from under the player some fundamentals they've taken for granted to force the player to solve for the missing fundamental by integrating other aspects of the core gameplay in new and interesting ways. The stealth challenge here is much better than the one we got before assassinating Swinburne. There, if we got spotted, we had to redo the mission. Here, when we get spotted, combat ensues. I suppose, for the sake of my love of restricting gameplay fundamentals to make challenges, that I should make a case for that challenge's decision to take our ability to get spotted away from us, to have us use the combat mech to navigate in shadows and behind buildings and walls and such, but taking away our custom-made mech and dumping us in the trash can, I really feel is the superior approach. Remember my talk on ambient quiet time, or what I said about quality scenario direction, or that I feel Yamamura has a really keen sense for utilizing combat to direct an emotion? It's all coming through in this section. This is the low point for us just before we rally and take the fight back to the enemies, and what's really cool about the rest of the game is that whatever ending we go for, we're in for some missions where we are let free to really go wild and tear things to shreds. For the praise I want to heap on this section, I will say it's good that it doesn't last much longer than it does, because I feel it might have easily been a drag on the experience, especially in subsequent playthroughs, if it was an extended part of the game. Having this brief exposure to the mech war from the other side, where we are the underpowered one, overwhelmed by superior firepower, is a welcome contrast, whose inclusion I think the experience gains a lot from. The story is about to reach the big moment where the player needs to choose the ending they want to pursue, and because the game is preparing to wind down, there's some revelations coming our way. Like that Walter and Carla are both members of the Overseer group, the guys who want to destroy the coral, and we also learn why we've been going on so many strange missions. Like the whole Asylum City thing. After Carla helps us escape and we get our mech back, Walter has gone missing and we do missions for Carla instead, like taking over Asylum City. When I first got there on my first playthrough, in the mission it first appeared in, it reminded me of the Cradles from Armored Core for Answer, so learning that this was also a giant flying city was not actually that big of a surprise. What was was learning that Carla's plan is to physically pilot the Xylem into the vascular facility to destroy it and the coral contained within it. 
Outside of the mech customization, the ending is probably the most stark player choice when it comes to characterizing Z4621. Armored Core protagonists do not have spoken dialogue themselves, aside from maybe a Leos Klein if you accept the Master of Arena theory, so we have to fish out who they are by looking at their interactions with others. Characterization-wise, the ending choices given to the player here are very economic because they all come from operator characters, so they are all a very natural extension to the relationship our protagonist has built with the people they've been interacting with in this journey. And because the characters here are all very well fleshed out, the choices you make will put you into conflict with someone. The prevailing order of the world is entering the tipping point, and every force is throwing everything they can to try and make things go their way. If we go along with Carla, Air will abandon us and will be made to destroy the Arquebus forces in another sequence very reminiscent of Armored Core for Answer. Like I said, every endgame mission has a moment where the player is encouraged to rip the world around them to shreds, and the Fires of Raven Path has this section, where our mech has infinite energy as we fly around in the coral and destroy the ships. We then have to fight our friend Rusty for the second time since he's an RLF guy and wants to protect the coral. This fight is very emotional, and it's strange just how much Rusty grows on us considering how little time we actually spent with him all in all. He has a second face, which is framed as him having too much resolve to die then and there, which is good characterization via gameplay, and when we defeat him, he talks about us having flown just out of reach. It kind of reminds me of the fight against Joshua O'Brien in Armored Core 4, what with the enemy being a really nice guy all throughout the game and then at the end dying by our hands with no real hatred of us personally. After defeating him, we prepare to ram the xylem into the vascular plant, but Air has taken over the orbiting satellites, again, Armored Core for answer, uh, she takes over the satellites and attacks the xylem. We then need to face off against her in her badass coral mech. So yeah, two really emotional boss fights close out this section, both against the friends we made on our journey so that we can fulfill the legacy of our master. The fight arena has pillars dangling out of the ground which feel reminiscent of those horizon trees we've seen in Dark Souls' Ash Lake, in the Hunter's Dream in Bloodborne, and even in Elden Ring. The fact that this imagery has shown up so often makes me think there's some meaning attached to the symbolism which is just going over my head. It's too specific, and it's shown up too often for me to think there's nothing to read into this. After we defeat Air, she tells us that she still believes in our shared dream, and then her mech powers off as the Silum is crashed into the vascular plant, igniting the coral and scorching the solar system in the fires of Raven. The corporations all leave Rubicon and it's unanimously decided that the planet ought to be abandoned. We disappear but the Cataclysm is named after us and we go down in history as a monster. The ramifications of this ending are that the loosening boundaries of life which the coral presented has been eradicated. Change by itself is a sort of pleasant sounding word but going along with it for its own sake is a very pathological idea. Certainly the eradication of all life is a change, and if we think of coral as a sort of living manifestation of the potential for transformation, then by igniting it again, we choose to close the door to change. Safeguarding mankind and the universe from the beauty and horrors which might otherwise await us. After the credits roll, we hear a recording from Walter Play where he thanks us for fulfilling his final wishes and we get his blessing to start living our own lives and making our own choices. Essentially, the game gives us the go-ahead to enter a new game plus and change the narrative up. So, if we rewind the clock a bit, back when Carla asked us to take over the Xylem, Air told us that she was not going to allow the Coral, her family, to be burnt, and she told us that there's a way for mankind and Coral to live together. She then asked us to take down Carla instead of helping her, and if we did, we'd attack her and Chatty, her AI pal, in what might be 
the most lopsided fight in the game. Or maybe I just need to get good at that one part. After we defeat the two, a failsafe system gets activated. The way it works is that after Carla dies, the Xylem is automatically set on path to collide with the vascular plant. Air asks us to stop it and she also sends out a beacon to the RLF for help. This is one of the best moments in the game because the player is overpowered mission here has us teaming up with our buddy in delivering a killing blow from the underdogs against the corporate powers. All's not good that ends well though because we get separated from Rusty in the scuffle and have to face off against Vesper V2 Snail. We actually have the option to fight him earlier which unlocks some unique dialogue in this fight and whether or not the player goes for that fight might be completely dependent on how much they want to get even with Snail for shutting us down after we beat the Ibis series. Now, Snail is piloting an Arquebus reconstruction of PCA's Boltius unit and he dishes out a lot of trash talk throughout the fight. He's one of the final plays Arquebus has at their disposal and when we take him out, they have to go for Brook. After the fight, we reopen communications with Rusty only to hear him be destroyed by a mysterious figure. It's Handler Walter, but for now, the game frames it as being a mysterious figure and since he's alive in this course of events, you might wonder if he's also alive in the fires of Raven Ending, which he apparently is, because after we took down the IP series, he was abducted by Archibus and made into an augmented cyborg himself. Once we've destroyed the Asylum's engines and its collision with the vascular plant has been prevented, Walter shows up and we have to fight. The man comes decked out in a coral mech whose color scheme could not shout nine ball any harder if they'd have actually just named the mech that. And design wise, what with the shoulder width and the unicorn horn dealy, Walter kinda looks like if White Glint had nine balls coloring. Along with Nine Ball, White Glint is probably the most iconic mech in the franchise and when I saw Walter's design I was actually grinning ear to ear like a total idiot. Every final boss in the game is piloting an IPIS series armored core and this one is absolutely the coolest. The augmentations which Walter underwent included Coral, we remember Assistant 1 doing some research with Coral augmentation and how Assistant 1 might have been Walter's father which makes this a tragic outcome for him. The augmentations seem to have really done a number on Walter's mind, but he still puts up a decent fight and I think the conviction he has because of the promises he's made is how he's able to keep fighting. After we defeat him, he takes aim at us but lowers his weapon when he sees that we've found a friend. I like that as a sort of redemption for his character since he's lived with the promise to destroy the coral for so long and now in the end, when he can see the coral for what it is, he chooses not to fire at us. The Coral and Rubicon are safe and Air promises us that together we can ensure a future where mankind and the Coral can prosper. The third and final, and true, ending is the Alea Iacta Est ending. It's a Latin phrase uttered by Caesar before he crossed the Rubicon and it means the die is cast. All of the cumulative forces acting on Rubicon 3 have been accelerating their efforts and the conclusions to the clash at the ending will be the ultimate verdict of history. Of course, since this is a video game, it will only change if we decide that it will change. Which means we're sort of playing the role of ultimate decider which makes the whole dice cast illusion maybe not connect so much. But then again, it might be very very apt because it may not be referencing us but rather all mine. So in the best twist reveal this game could have possibly pulled off, which I'm sure nobody saw coming, we learn in the third ending that the corporations and the RLF and every other faction have all secretly been manipulated by an AI all along. I didn't find any material in the game which absolutely laid bare what All Might's precise motives were, but because this is an Armored Core game, I'm going to move ahead assuming it is what it always is with the AIs in this franchise and that All Mind has taken its job as a support network too seriously and is trying to create a future which is safe for mankind. 
All Mind is my favorite AI villain in the franchise, and I think a lot of it just comes down to the presentation. So, I've noted in the series retrospective that the middlemen organizations usually have a really neutral attitude to the mech war, and this is something All Mind shakes up on. The Raven's Nest, way back when, was controlled by the AI, which also controlled the corporations there, but that game didn't really play on the user interface itself being the evil AI as much as Fires of Rubicon does. Because once this revelation clicks, all of a sudden a lot of the weirdness and nonsensical elements in the story start to add up. Like, ever wondered what the deal is with Sulla? Allmind's shop has parts from every faction, but there are also parts which can only be obtained by playing through the arena and interacting with Allmind, and Sulla just so happens to have some of those because he's in league, or used to be in league, with the AI. Ever wondered who tipped Sulla off that we'd be in the watchpoint area? Ever wondered why his arena data is corrupted? Ever wondered why Allmind only gives us access to the new arena fights in New Game Plus after we beat Sulla? It's because he's its number one guy. Allmind is not all powerful, it manipulates events to align better with its plan rather than being able to dominate everyone with its will, so when Sulla is out, we become its number one prospect and it begins to groom us as Sulla's successor. Because Allmind believes in coral release. Coral attracts coral in a process called convergence, but it's an accelerating process, and like Nagai understood, if it goes out of hand, there's no way to correct it. The coral will gather and then collapse like a black hole, attracting every last ounce of coral around it before exploding and scattering the material across the universe. This will expose humanity worldwide to it and trigger the symbiosis. Not everyone is guaranteed to survive, and what mankind will look like on the other side is very much an open question. Characters like Thumb Dolmayan and Assistant Number One show us that there's reasons to fear the process, but this is also the logical endpoint of the mech war and human existence in this universe. After we complete the new arena fights in New Game Plus Plus, Air remarks that conflict is the key to evolution, which echoes what I talked about way back with the Fremen in Dune, and how mankind and its environment often shape each other. There's no promise that what's on the other side of Coral release is desirable, but to not pull the trigger runs afoul of everything this game and these games stand for. A stalled evolution is a stagnant life, and stagnation is Kegare. Is it right to stop at the human level, or should we throw the dice, eh? on symbiosis. For All Mind to succeed, for coral release to occur, a human touch is needed. The arena bios often talk about human augmentation, and the game makes it clear that there were numerous experiments with AI versus mankind, and that human pilots always won out. In fact, human pilots were so much better than the AI that they killed the era of unmanned weapons. All Mind spends a lot of time gathering combat data to try to create the perfect mech, and that's possibly integral to its plans because the mech might be the key to the perfect human coral symbiosis. One of the arena fighter bios even notes that mankind and coral can co-evolve with the mechs. So All Mind is trying to enact the plan of coral release, and it needs some human beings on site to get it done. Previous games asked the question, what separates men from machines? Fires of Rubicon makes it clear that the separation is will. The story is all about it, and it's the key human characteristic which All Mind's ending toys around with. It wants to create the symbiosis of mankind and Coral, and if we assume that All Mind is acting on an instinct to support mankind, possibly from itself even, then it makes sense for All Mind to believe in managing the process rather than letting the future come about organically. When that's tried, we get the Fires of Ibis, which nearly put a permanent end to any hope for Coral release. So All Mind is in a snack where it really needs the corporations to collect the Coral, but needs to stop them from burning it. The RLF and the Overseers can kinda help with that in places, but those two have very different ideas of what the future should be like, so All Mind really can't have either of them around for its plans to succeed. So, it plays the human forces against one another. 
It sets itself up as the broker and middleman for every faction, and then manipulated the circumstances on Rubicon 3 such that the Eternal War would be perpetuated and the forces would accelerate the rush to find the coral. This centralized it in the vascular plant, and the mass of coral keeps expanding until it will inevitably reach a tipping point and get to the coral convergence which will bathe the galaxy in the stuff and force the symbiosis on mankind. After All Mind has tweaked all of the outcome variables, that is, to guarantee the outcome it wants because there's reason to think it wants to do more than simply evolve mankind. This playthrough recontextualizes the entire experience, but it starts out relatively unassuming. We get the option to sabotage the Attack the Dam complex mission early on by attacking Balaam's retguns instead of the RLF. Then we get to do some missions for the RLF and eventually All Mind gets us to do some exclusive arena fights for it and we do missions with the mysterious Kate Markson who also rocks up with All Mind exclusive parts, because there is no Kate Markson, it's all All Mind pulling a nine ball and piloting the mech itself, and eventually we just do missions for All Mind outright. When we betray the Red Guns in the Attack of the Dam Complex mission, on this ending path, we earned the ire of Iguazu. He's basically the anti-Rusty, in that as the game goes on, he is constantly shown to be inferior to us, and where Rusty talked about us in a positive light and talked about flying higher with us and what have you, Iguazu just develops a massive inferiority complex. And he's fittingly enough most prominent in the storyline which gets us to the third ending. The big split from the previous two playthroughs occurs in the Institute City mission where we fought the Ibis series boss. In this path, we don't engage the boss, and instead we are flagged as a casualty, taken off the grid, and we do missions for All Mind like going after the Vespers. The Mac War continues, just like All Mind foresaw, and we are smuggled by it into the Xylem in order to give control of it to All Mind before the Xylem can crash into the vascular plant. While we do, Carla and Walter learn that we're alive and talk about our betraying their mission. I got the feeling going through this section that the game was really setting up for a duo fight against Carla and Walter, which I dreaded, but when the boss comes, it's actually All Might itself which intends to destroy us now that it no longer needs us and absorb us into itself. And to show that this boss is no pushover, it has already destroyed both Carla and Walter. All Might is a computer program, so it cannot suffer the chaos of human will. This is why it tries to absorb us into itself, and I think it's fair to assume that it had similar intentions for the rest of mankind in the Coral Release program. Pull the trigger on release like normal, but perhaps insert itself into the process as well. Maybe upload the collective hive mind of humanity, be the mind for everyone, or all, and eradicate the chaos, the irregularities it cannot accept. The chaos of will. In the fighting, we learn that Iguazu's inferiority complex drove him to abandon his humanity and upload himself into All Mind in order to take us out. Nothing mattered more to him. He was another pre-fifth gen augmented human, like us and Sola and O'Keefe, whom I haven't actually talked about at all in this video, and when we fight Iguazu underground, near all of the coral, we see that he's hearing the voices. He's a candidate for All Might's champion, and because everyone else but us and him are out of the game, he's the person All Might has to team up with. After a while, Air joins us in her mech to help even the odds, and I quite like this partnership. It's a much realer showcase of a human being and Coral working together than anything else we've seen in the game, and although this symbiosis is All Might's stated mission, it doesn't pull back from the fight. But what does happen is that All Mind gets done in by its own bad assumptions. So I talked about how I liked Walter choosing not to pull the trigger in the Liberator of Rubicon ending because of him seeing Coral for what it truly was and that there actually was a possibility for a prosperous future for it and mankind. In spite of his decades old promises and his mental reprogramming by Archibus, he was able to put the gun down because of his ability to be human to change his mind. 
All Might being an AI does not have the capacity for this sort of sentimentality and it gets done in by its own irreverent attitude to human willpower when Iguazu overpowers it from within and takes over the fight. His very human will to fight locks All Might completely out of the system. Iguazu is noted in his bio to be a brash, hot-tempered idiot. You can really think of him as the polar opposite of C4621. He has an instinctively hard time with obeying authority. We follow our orders until we are convinced to do otherwise. He complains about how unfair things are, we get good and push through the struggles to become stronger. And we dedicate ourselves to growth over an extended period of time, but he looks for a shortcut. Rather than use his human capability to improve himself, he joins up with the AI because he believes it's a faster path towards his objective of becoming stronger than us so that he can destroy us. And all of this also makes All Mind an interesting clash against Air. Because Air seems to genuinely care about us. We have a healthy symbiotic relationship with her, but Iguazu and All Mind could not be more different. And for all of All Mind's plans and schemes and even after calculating for every outcome, it was continually put back by the efforts of human beings. Walter's champion killed its first champion. Iguazu hijacks its fight against us, and assuming it's been alive long enough, Nagai ignited the fires of Ibis and nearly ended all potential for coral release. Carol Dory's words at the end of Armored Core 5 that exceptional human beings prove that the species may have a future ring very true here when we see the die cast and the AI always failing to calculate for the human element. Once we've won the fight, All Might is left without a body and with no capacity to continue battle. And so it asks us what we intend to do. We go through with Coral release and the world is forever changed. We wake up an indetermined time later in the ocean piloting our default mech. We stand up and look into the skies to see a cosmos bathed in Coral. Other mechs rise out of the water around us and we are left to wonder about the happenings to come and the era we've found ourselves in. Its potentially horrifying reality is affirmed before the title screen when Air utters the immortal words As for us, here in the real world, I think things are looking pretty good. When I first saw the announcement trailer for this game, I was actually surprised to see that the next FromSoft Mac game, which we knew was coming, was another Armored Core. And after playing the game, I feel that even though the Naotoshi Shin, Toshifumi Nabishima era has clearly ended, there's still a deep continuity in the franchise, and I'd welcome more games like this one. Toshifumi Nabishima joined From Software in 1996 right after Kingsfield 3 was released, and in those days, the company was still split between office software development and video games. And the stories he's told of working on the first game are a really interesting snapshot of a particular time in history. Zin's desire to make a PC game made a lot of the staffers very uneasy because they knew it meant 3D polygons. They didn't know that the PlayStation 1 was coming with CD-ROMs to make this dream come true, but fortuitous timing came when Kingsfield 1 was released because it was actually one of the PlayStation's very first games. But Armored Core was the company's first game. They just couldn't make it before the tech caught up. Some staffers felt that Zin pivoting to video games was reckless, but Nabashima sees things differently. He wasn't there during the development of Kingsfield 1, but he's said that all of the recklessness was mitigated by the context the studio got its foot in the door in this industry in. Because they went with 3D polygons, they were on even ground with much more established developers because those developers had honed skills and institutional know-how about how to handle games in 2D. Everyone was sailing blind in the early days of 3D animation. So much so, in fact, that when Nabishima was designing for Armored Core 1, he actually brought in robot drawings made by his dad, only for Jin to tell him those drawings sucked and that he needed to find someone better to make the max. This was almost 30 years ago. Today, From has a house style, and although Nabishima has left the company and Jin has stepped back and allowed the new generation to take over, the mark both men made on the studio and the way it makes games can still be felt. 
Fires of Rubicon did not need to be an armored core game, and I suppose one can argue that its wilder departures from series tradition maybe makes it feel a bit too distinct, maybe makes it feel like it should have been called something else. Armored Core is an established name with a lot of goodwill with people, and there's a real danger in diluting the brand for the sake of pushing sales, but Armored Core was never successful because it had a good name. The games were good, and that mattered more than anything else. The value of any studio is the people who work there, and much more than just showing us that the Armored Core name can push copies, I think Fires of Rubicon vindicates that idea. Let quality people take charge, and you get quality games, and to see something as out of style from the rest of the AAA industry succeed, like this game has, is always a great cause for delight. Fires of Rubicon is not my personal favorite of the series, but it's a great experience nevertheless, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what comes next. If you enjoyed this video, consider joining the channel Patreon over at patreon.com slash medieval megaman. It gets you early access to these videos, and it helps me massively in getting the time to assemble them. And for the next video I'm making, I'll need all the time I can get, because in 2024, we'll be dipping our toes directly into the most requested video in the channel's history. I've already made the Estes vs. Grass, or, you know, From Software Healing Discussion video, it's up on Patreon, and I have a script ready for Bioshock 2, so I might release those two before the Silent Hill 4 commentary, just to have some videos to go while I assemble it. I might also record some conversation videos, which you guys seem to like, and I might make some smaller videos to market my game when it releases, and that's sort of a big announcement. With the release of this video, I'm officially not going back into the YouTube mines until my game is finished. It might be a couple of months, but I've been burnt on scheduling this before, so it might be as much as half a year. It's very much in the finishing stretches, so I'm really hoping to have it out by Christmas, again, but I want to release it already, so I'm not going to be distracting myself again with video editing in the meanwhile. I'll still be around though, I'll do some more streams here and there and whittle away on some other projects if I have time. If you want to see those announcements, or if you just want to have more in-depth conversations on the games covered in these videos than what this site's commenting system can provide, be sure to hit up the channel Discord, linked in the video description. I'd like to thank you all for going on this Armored Core series retrospective ride with me, and I hope you'll support me in what's to come. I'm Aesir Aesthetics, see you in the next video. Concerns of Pat Labor are sort of how Armored Core is. Armored Core goes completely off the rails though and becomes like about transhumanism and like growing like cyborgs and stuff um, toward the end of it, but that's like... <sighs> Did you get any? You didn't get Human Plus, did you? I can tell because you haven't brought it up. Mm. No, I, I haven't. Oh man, Human Plus is so cool. Okay, so right, this is what I mean because like you were talking about. I'm going to play Armored Core and we'll talk about. It, and I said it's going to take you a while. Like, nah. And I said yeah. you'll miss all the good stuff, and you did. So, um, <laughs> throughout throughout the game, um, you will hear like oblique references to people digging and finding old pre-war technology, right? I assume that happened when you were like going to the underground bases and stuff. Oh, probably. Yeah, probably. Okay, so you'll hear about like oh, okay. Um, it looks like Sophie. I don't. When these blocks of text appear on screen, I just pr I just press X as fast as I can. I want to get through that crap. It's like Dark Souls. You're missing the story if you ignore the text. There is no story. It's just Max. Oh. <laughs> oh. No.